This morning we continue in the book of Joshua, um, and the title for the message this morning is A Big Deal, and our text is Joshua chapter 8, um, verses 30 to 35. D.A. Carson, um, in his book, The God Who Is There, asks an important question, and it is this, how shall we think of the relationship between God and human beings? How shall we think of the relationship between God and human beings? Well, that is an important question. I hope you Appreciate that. You know, how does God relate to us? Or on the other hand, the other side of the coin, how should we relate to Him? I mean, it's an all-important question. I mean, if you get that wrong, then likely everything else in your life is wrong. Well, let us note, as Carson does, three different views in answering this question in how people relate to God or or see God relating to them. Three different views. Firstly, there is the view of of God as the super soft grandfather, where God is a benevolent gentleman with a long flowing beard whose primary job is to be nice. That God is good, And so he's bound just to forgive us, that is his job. That's one view, generalizing how people view and relate to God as a super soft grandfather. Secondly, God is the distant clockmaker, where God is seen, yes, as big and great, but yet not involved at all in this world, and certainly not in our individual lives. That like a clockmaker who who makes a clock, winds it up, and then leaves it to run down on its own, the thinking is, in effect, that God has done the same with us and the world that He has made. Set it up and then step back, uninvolved, the distant clockmaker. And then finally, and perhaps maybe what is most common, is seeing God as the divine backscratcher. We, in a way, God is fickle and needy, so if you are nice to Him, well, then He'll be nice for you. It's like a tit-for-tat kind of relationship, and so it's one where you've got to keep God appeased. Otherwise, He may become bad-tempered and turn on you, and that is, in effect, how many of the other religions in the world would operate. So, I guess the question is, well, which is it? You know, are any of those right? Um, How does God relate to us? Well, most of us here will appreciate that while some of those may have an element of truth in it, in them, none of them are right. They all get it wrong because they all in some way distort or ignore God's character and who He really is as He's revealed Himself in the Bible. They all are really caricatures of God. You see, thankfully, the truth is God is not like we would like Him to be? Yes? That's a good thing. That God is not like we would like Him to be. Or how we might imagine Him to be. He is in reality much better. He is in reality altogether different. He is, of course, holy in everything and in every way. I mean, today we shall see that God relates to us in ways that are staggering. Not least of all in that He, from the beginning as He has related to mankind, does so by entering into covenant with us, meaning entering into personal relationship with us. And He does this not because of our goodness, but ultimately because of His grace. That then requiring our hearts, our lives, our total allegiance unto Him. You see, what we're going to see today is indeed how knowing God is, at a number of levels, a big deal. 
That's what it is. So let us read Joshua chapter 8, verse 30 to 35 as our text. So at that time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones upon which no man has wielded an iron tool. And they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there in the presence of the people of Israel, Joshua wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. And all Israel, sojourner as well as native born, with their elders and officers, and their judges stood on opposite sides of the ark before the Levitical priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at the first to bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel, and the women, and the little ones, and the sojourners who lived among them. Now, you may be thinking, what a strange passage. What on earth are we going to understand out of that, and how does that relate to anything that we've said so far? Well, firstly, we need to appreciate that this is a very significant moment in the book of Joshua. It is, a, it is as if here the people of Israel pause. They pause to take stock of all that has happened so far and reflect, as it were, on what really matters. Their quest to conquer the land is put on hold as they remind themselves here of God and of their unique relationship with Him. And so they assemble together to renew their covenant with Him. A lot has happened since entering the land, you'll recall, not least of all crossing the Jordan River, but then two big victories over Jericho and Ai, but only after that humiliating defeat at Ai because of Israel's sin. But what this has meant in effect is that the two biggest obstacles for them to entering into the land and gaining the land is now behind them, mainly the cities of Jericho and Ai. And so they're almost at a point here where the rest of the land and taking possession of it is now inevitable. It's a fait accompli. It's just a matter of time until they're able to take on and um, conquer the rest of the tribes and cities. In fact, having passed as they crossed the Jordan up through the hill country and en route defeating Jericho and Ai, they are now literally on the top of the land. They've crested the hill country and the rest now is there before them, waiting to be conquered. And so they are at, in many ways, therefore, a, a prime time in their journey into the land to pause and to take stock after what has already happened and of what they see now remains before them. But as they do that, already there is a point of, I think, application for us as God's people today of just simply this. I wonder whether we do this enough um, and pause. W- whether we do enough in our daily routine and, 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 uh, and weekly life and, and monthly um, priorities to rehearse what God has done for us, to reflect on where our lives are at, 
to renew our allegiance to Him. I mean, we live in a world today when there always seems better things to be done. There's always seemingly more important or certainly more urgent things to do. You know, there's more people to see. There's more friends to meet. There's more places to go. There's more chores to do. More broken items of technology to fix. More online posts to see and to make. Yet Israel were there with more land to conquer right before them, but they chose to pause. You know, it's funny that we all, whether we're young or old, have great FOMO. I mean, that's why we're on our phones so often. But we seldom seem to experience FOMO with God. So what is FOMO? It is nothing other than the fear of missing out. Yes? Thank you for that clarification, Bessel. But we seldom seem to worry about that when it comes to God. We just carry on with life. So there's something here to be said for us in our Christian lives pausing and reflecting, and not just rushing on with everything else. You need to meet with Him. Perhaps the whole Martha Mary scenario, where there are times where maybe we need to sit at Jesus' feet, and we don't. But secondly, not only is this a poignant moment for them to renew their commitment to God, but this is what also God had specifically commanded the people to do earlier back in Deuteronomy through Moses, as the account here reminds us, before they entered the land, this is what they were told to do when they did enter the land. It's important for us to read this because this is what gives shape um, to this account here. So turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 27, um, which is, you'll be glad to know, just the book before Joshua, easy to find in the Old Testament. Chapter 27, verses 1 to 8. You don't have to go too far. Where we see the instruction given for what we see them do here. Now Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, Keep the whole commandment that I command you today. And here it is, on the day you cross over the Jordan to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall set up large stones and plaster them with plaster. And you shall write on them all the words of the law when you cross over to enter the land that the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey as the Lord, the God of your fathers has promised you. And when you have crossed over the Jordan... You shall set up these stones concerning which I command you today on Mount Ebal, and you shall plaster them with plaster. And there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. And you shall wield no iron tool on them. You shall build an altar to the Lord your God of uncut stones. And you shall offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God, and you shall sacrifice peace offerings, and shall eat there, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God. And you shall write on the stones all the words of this law very plainly. So it's incredible. The commandment was given, the instructions were given clearly by Moses to the people and to Joshua to do this very thing that they are now doing upon entering the land. And you notice how much to the detail that they followed what they were originally commanded to do. That's why the significance of reading that. They were obedient. They did exactly what they had to. They assembled in this plain between these two mountains here, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, half of them standing on the one side, on the side of Mount Ebal, and half on the other side on Mount Gerizim. They built an altar as they were instructed from uncut stones, and did that and placed it on Mount Ebal. And on the whitewashed stones, Joshua wrote the law, likely just the Ten Commandments, 
not the entire law, but those with the sum of the law, as we know, wrote those on the stones of the altar. And then, as instructed, they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. It was a specific, deliberate, relatively elaborate um, ceremony and renewal of the covenant and offering of sacrifices that they did. And as Moses, Moses would further instruct them in Deuteronomy, Joshua then, afterwards, as we see here, read out the law together with its blessings and its curses. And specifically, as he was instructed, the blessing was read from Mount Gerizim's side, and the curses were read from Mount Ebal's side, where the altar was. Now, what is interesting, with all of this going down in the ceremony, is that it happened here in this particular area, that God specifically chose beforehand that that's where they must do it, between these two mountains. Because the geography was such that in, the, in this plain, in the middle, with these mountains um, close together on either side, it actually formed something of an amphitheater. So that as Joshua read the law, whether on this side or on that side, with all the blessings and the curses, everyone would have heard the sound would have carried to the couple million of Israelites that were there. And so isn't it just interesting to note that, that just how sovereign God is, that the setting, not just spiritually were the people ready for this moment, but even everything geographically was perfect for this moment of this covenant renewal. And so the people obeyed everything that God had called them too. And I think it's important to again note here how God has provided for us certain means, certain graces, certain settings for which we can similarly unite, similarly assemble, and similarly renew our covenant with Him and similarly express our devotion to Him. And that is not least of all what we're doing right now. God's provision of gathering week after week for corporate worship. Whereas we gather in a particular space, it happens to be here, 23A Cathedral Street, or now 23A and 23B Cathedral Street, in this particular place, where we have the means to be able to, with some amplification, sing and pray and, and share and, and, and rehearse all of God's goodness and reflect on our lives and, and renew our commitment to Him to be reminded of all His promises, to be reminded of the gospel as they are reminded of God's promises, and to reaffirm our commitment to Him. I mean, this gathered setting of church on Sunday after Sunday is really a perfect setting for us to recall God's power and to relive His grace. It really is. God has set this up for us sovereignly and wisely and graciously. But yet how easily we can take it for granted, gathering together week after week like this. So often we we gather only because we're serving on a Sunday, or so often we gather because, well, there's nothing better to do on a Sunday at this time. And yet the writer of Hebrews makes it so clear that we should not um, be like some who are in the habit of not meeting together, but instead we must encourage one another all the more daily. In, in, the, in the New Testament letters like Ephesians and, and Colossians, it speaks about how we should be speaking songs and psalms and, and spiritual songs to one another, how, how we should be sharing God's Word to one another, how we should be encouraging and doing good for one another. It's like such a routine thing, but yet it is such a significant thing. This is God's grace, God's provision to regularly meet together like this for worship. It's not optional, really. It isn't something extra. It's something essential to our Christian lives, gathering together. And even gathering together here, as they did, like with young and old, with the men and the women and the little ones, and even the sojourners who lived among them. It's so important to gather together as families for worship like this. It really is. John Piper puts it well when he writes, God-centered Family worship is supremely important. God-centered family worship is supremely important. Our hectic 21st century life 
leaves little time for significant togetherness. I think we all know that. It is hard to overestimate, then, the good influence of families doing valuable things together week in, week out, year in and year out. And worship is the most valuable thing a human can do. So gather together. Further, surely what we've done today, the special provision of communion, is even added incentive and reason to gather, to be deliberate about gathering, to be sure that in your calendar for a month that you, if you are, are going to be here on a Sunday, it will be the Sunday when we meet for communion, where we rehearse in a new covenant sense what they were rehearsing in an old covenant sense. That's what it is. That's what the Lord has instituted for us to partake as we did in a special, in a unique way. Of the bread and of the wine to remind ourselves of what God and Christ has done for us. It's not insignificant. It's one thing to, to prioritize gathering together on a Sunday, but it's, it's even another thing to, gather, to prioritize gathering around communion on that first Sunday of the month. But I think we've lost that. We treat it as just something that happens. And if I'm there, I'm there. If I'm not, I'm not. But no, it's significant. It's important. It's part of God's provision of grace in His sovereignty and in His wisdom and in His grace. We need to realize that. Significance. But still, thirdly, we ask, why did God give all this instruction like this for His covenant renewal? The altar and the blessings read here and the curses read there. Some people on this side, some people on that side, the law written on the stones. What is that all about? What is it all for? What it was to, to highlight this important reality of the basis of God's relationship to His people. What it all rested on. It was to highlight the essence of how we are able to, how they are able to relate to God. And to understand the significance then of this and all this instruction and detail and ceremony and renewal that they did, we need to take a step back slightly and recount what the nature is, the biblical nature of this thing that's happening here in terms of covenants. What is this? Maybe like FOMO, covenant is a word we don't really understand. Well, from the Bible, from the beginning, we see that a covenant, first of all, was always something that God initiated. In other words, God entering into relationship with His people was something that always was his initiative, and therefore always based on grace, always Him coming down to us. We could never just know God or relate to God unless He made the first move. You know, the Creator has to reach down to, to the creature. And so that's the first point of the covenant, is that it's about God coming down to us, God taking the initiative to, to enable us to know Him. Otherwise, we never would. I mean, that's what is even implicit in the fact that He created us so that we could then know Him. And the whole Bible is God coming down to our level to do that as He walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. But, but even here, as He then made His presence manifest with His people in this particular item of furniture in which... Um, the law was, and over which he would then dwell in the temple and tabernacle, but where the, the priests would, would gather around, as they did here, this thing called the Ark of the Covenants, that that represented the presence of God. That's what went before them as they crossed the Jordan. That was went, went in the midst of them as they walked around Jericho. It was a symbol for the presence of God, for God being with them. And so here it is, God has made provision for him to be seen, to have come down, to be with his people in the form of the Ark of the Covenant carried with the priests, which you notice in this setup was at the very center of everything. It was the Ark and then the priests and then some people on this side and some people on that side. And so the very nature of the covenant is God making a first move and coming down to our level. God graciously allowing us to know Him, revealing Himself to us. You know, so much for the idea 
that we saw in the beginning of God sort of winding up the universe and then just leaving it. So the whole concept of covenant makes it clear that God is personal. God has, has in, with an in, in amazing grace, come down to know us. But secondly, we need to note that therefore God is the one who initiates the covenant. He is naturally the one who sets up the terms and conditions, which is in part where he said he would be their God and, and they would be his people as they obeyed the law, as they kept the law. Um, that was part of the covenant, part of the agreement, part of the deal. And so that's why the law was written on the stones and read out here. Um, and so we must understand then that, that with all of this so far, a biblical covenant is, is though more than just an agreement, it's, it's a bond. It establishes an all-encompassing relationship where there was um, commitment and promise and where there was obligation and, 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 and requirement and conditions. In, in one sense, it's unconditional. In another sense, it's conditional. So as one writer expresses, covenants were not merely contracts or, or just promises. Rather, covenants were relationships under authority with both obligation and rewards. Not merely legal obligations, but much more. In this biblical context, it was a claim on someone's loyalty and allegiance. God's taking His very character and His faithfulness on being their God, and them then requiring to commit their allegiance and their hearts to Him in obedience to their law. And to show this, the significance of this, the depth of this, of this kind of covenant, that when a covenant was made, they weren't necessarily just written, but they were, they were often also cut, meaning that when a covenant was made, it often involved the shedding of blood. And on one hand, the blood was shed kind of um, as a seal, kind of as a closing, as, as, a, as a statement of ratifying the covenant, like we would give a signature or, or a handshake today, perhaps. Only then, obviously a lot more serious and a lot more real. In fact, often what happened was an animal was literally cut in two to symbolize the severity of the consequence. That you were saying, in effect, if I break this covenant with you, may what happened to the animal happen to me. That's how committed I am. That's what this is meaning. That's what I'm entering into. And so in this way also, the, the cutting of, of the covenant and the and this shedding of blood was also a sign. Um, it was a sign of the picture of the consequence of what would happen if any party broke the covenant. And so perhaps that is why when the people gathered here, they were cut in two. Half of the people on this side near Mount Gerizim and half of the people on that side near Mount Ebal, symbolizing the significance as a sign and a seal of breaking the covenant. And so yes, while it was a great privilege to be entered into covenant with God, wow, such a great responsibility. And hence, what was also happening, or what also happened, is the blessings were read out and the curses for breaking the blessings for keeping the covenant and the curses for breaking the covenant were read out. And so again, so much for God being like a soft grandfather type figure who must always just be nice and forgive. No, he's a God of justice, a God of holiness, a God of righteous, a God of standard, where there's law, where there's commandments, and where there's judgment for breaking them. And of course, we know, though, from Israel's past and, and how the rest of the story goes, that Israel do not keep their side of the covenants. They cannot keep the covenants, in fact, can they? And so that's why, all importantly, there is what in the midst of the ceremony? All importantly, there is an altar, you see. In fact, the account begins by highlighting the prominence and importance of the altar. That's where it starts, with Joshua building an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel on Mount Ebal, just as the Moses, the servants, had 
commandment. And you notice then that on that altar, offerings were sacrificed on it. Highlighting the need, therefore, for, for provision for, for breaking the covenant. Because you notice two things, that, that the law was written on the stones from which the altar was made. That is what had to be kept. But on top of that, those stones where the law was written, the sacrifice was made. Because the people would not keep the law. And so the sacrifice was made to provide for provision to make payment in part for the consequence of the sin. Of the reality that they were bound to break the law. And the reality that they could not stay in, in the covenant unless there was provision of sacrifice on their behalf. But secondly, notice on which mountain the altar was built. The altar was built on Mount Ebal. And what happened on Mount Ebal? Well, specifically regarding the recounting of the blessings and curses that Joshua read out. What happened from Mount Ebal? Well, here's the instruction that was given in Deuteronomy 11 about this incident. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, you shall set the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. So what does that mean? Is that the curse says for breaking the law were read from Mount Ebal. And that was intentional. Why? Because the altar was on Mount Ebal. The sacrifice was taking place on Mount Ebal to cover the curse for the people who would inevitably break the law. And so what is underscored here is how from start to finish the covenant rests on God's grace. On God's provision. And so, so much then too for God being a, a, a divine backscratcher, because we will never be able to keep God happy. We'll never be able to please Him sufficiently. We can never scratch God's back enough. We will always sin. We'll always come under the curse. And so, the only way we can relate to God is through God mercifully accepting a sacrifice for my sin in my place. Hence, the provision of the altar on Mount Ebal where the curses were read. So a covenant with God, our relationship with God, could only ever last if God provided a way to forgive us. And so all of this highlights for us then, all this detail, all the particular ceremony, is to ultimately show us that the only way we relate to God is grace. And so that brings us now, finally, to the big question of how are you and I relating to God? And have we rightly understood that the only way we can relate to Him is like this, through grace. I wonder when the tribes were being separated then between Mount Gerizim side and, and Mount Ebal side, whether they weren't all kind of putting up their hands to be on the Mount Gerizim side, you know, to be on the Mount of Blessing. Who wants to go to Mount Ebal and be on the Mount of Curse? No thanks. You know, I want to be on this side. And so you wonder, too, if those tribes that ended up on Mount Ebal didn't feel like they had maybe drawn the short straw, you know? I wonder if you and I were there, what we would have wanted, which side of the mountain we would have wanted to be. And I'm sure we would have all gone for Mount Gerizim to be on the side of blessing, right? But yet, what we fail to forget so easily and quickly is the side of blessing was blessings for keeping the law, right? Blessings for keeping the law and getting it right, in keeping faithful, in, in living perfectly for God. Those of you who, who are good enough for God, come to Mount Jerusalem and be on the side of blessing. The Bible makes clear in Romans, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. So will you do all the law? Will I do all the law? Or as we read in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So clearly we're seeing it is somewhat presumptuous to think that we should be on Mount Jerusalem. But yet that is how so many live, don't they? 
So many people live today, maybe, maybe even some of us here, thinking that they can relate to God by coming to Mount Jerusalem, by doing good, by performing enough moral acts or spiritual rituals. That, that in effect, they think they can relate to God by bribing to God, by bribing God in effect, doing enough good for Him. But how foolish. We can never be good enough. It's like rubbing your hand over a rough piece of wood and getting splinters if you think you can get to God through Mount Jerusalem. It opposes the whole fabric of salvation and the whole nature of the human heart. Now, don't you see that if you were there that day, you sort of run to Mount Ebal, knowing that you're a sinner, knowing that you are cursed and deserve the curse, and that and ultimately will break the law and bring God's curse on yourself. That we, should have, that we would, would run to Mount Ebal because that is who we are, sinners, lawbreakers, unable to please God. But more so, of course, we should have run to Mount Ebal because what was there? What was there? The altar was there. The altar was there. The sacrifice was there. The provision of forgiveness was there. A way to be spared death that I deserve because of sin was there. And yes, so for us today, we don't run to Mount Ebal, but for us today, we need to see that we run to Mount Calvary, to the final altar, to the cross where Jesus was sacrificed, cursed in our place, so that we could once and for all know the blessing of eternal life with God. How sad that in the world today, there are so many lies, so many lies telling people out there that they can come to Mount Jerusalem, as it were, that they can have a, a blessed life on their own, either through some other religion that they follow, or through some moral endeavor, or through expressing their individual freedom and becoming all that they were meant to be. But yet in doing that, they're living on the wrong mountain. They're living where there is no provision for mistakes, where there's no provision for failure, where there's no provision for sin, where there's no altar, where there's no cross. And so that's why they keep trying harder and harder. And that's why those who seem to have it all in Hollywood or on Instagram end up committing suicide. Because none of that can satisfy. Because you can never be good enough. Let alone for God, you can never be good enough for yourself even. How sad that even in the church, this is taught and encouraged. The anti-gospel of works and self-efforts. Do this and God will do that. Give money and He will give you more. Pray right and He will heal you. Follow these five steps and you will have the full life. But again, it's the same principle. There is no blessing without payment for curse. There is no blessing without an altar, without the cross. There is never any blessing without the gospel. As Paul makes so clear, when he writes in Galatians 3, 13 to 14, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Christ was cursed on that final altar on the cross on Mount Calvary where darkness came over the land and when the earth shook and quaked, where He cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that there can be once for all a way for us to know God, once for all a way for us to have our sin forgiven, once for all to enter into a new covenant a covenant sealed in Christ's blood, and His blood a sign that our sin has been paid for once for all because He was cursed and not us. 
And so now we can stand as Christians on Mount Gerizim, blessed, and know all the blessing of God, because Jesus has paid once for all the curse for us, because in Christ God has kept both sides of the deal, both sides of the covenant. And so we can now know God ultimately, intimately, lovingly, eternally. And so we have so much to rejoice in as His people, so much to be thankful for, so much to sing about, so much to delight in, so much to live for, namely for Him, now with His law even written on our hearts, giving us new affections, giving us new desires, giving us new delights in serving and honoring Jesus with all of our lives. That's how we relate to God, by His grace. And it's a relationship that is secured forever. For our names are written in the book of life because of the blood of the Lamb, whose song we will sing forever. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Let us pray. Our God and Father, thank you for your grace this morning. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the blessing that we have received through Jesus Christ. Thank you that we come to you now freely and fully. No more sacrifice, no more altar, but simply through Jesus who paid it all. We realize there are some here today who have not understood who are still coming to Mount Gerizim on their own, who haven't yet run to Mount Ebal in the altar, to the cross. I pray that you would help them to see their need to do that. Deliver us, O oh God, from times of temptation, times of foolishness, to when we rest on our own goodness, when we think that our deeds will improve Christ's work, never. Our relationship with you begins and ends, stands and falls on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for all that he's done and the confidence that we can have therefore in him, the blessing, the every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms that we have received through Jesus Christ. Redemption and forgiveness and adoption and justification and regeneration and ultimate glorification. How we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.